Okay. So uh, you do remember the um, awesome product catalog and uh, um, product voting um, that we did uh, yesterday. Uh, the, the classes have changed a little bit. We have added a popularity view. I'm not sure if this is going to work, but let's try it. No. Uh, we've added a popularity view. We've added a popularity controller. Uh, we also have a new model called product likes. Uh, and we can see that the yellow classes are the model classes. So they are, um, uh, they have no relationship to any class except except for the, uh, for the other model classes. Uh, so between product catalog, there is a relationship to product. And from product like, there is a relationship to pro product. Uh, we can see that almost all the views, except the navigation view, also has a relationship to a model class. They need that in order to make HTML from this model information. From the model states, they create HTML. Uh, the navigation view does not have a relationship to a model class right now. Um, it could have, but um, I've, I've tried to um, isolate it a little bit. You can see that almost every view, or all three of the views, have relationships to it. So we might want to. Um, consider some kind of refactoring on that clause later. OK, we can also see that we have two uh, controllers, and they have relationships to both views and uh, models. Um, you do remember the application consisted of two different views, and we separated those views with, uh, with a, a, um, a get uh, parameter. Uh, so if if um, if we specify a product, we will view the product. If we spe spe don't specify a product, we will uh, get the view produced by product catalog view. Uh, there is an error right now in this application since we left it with an error. But I've actually removed the error uh, before this lecture when I prepared for the lecture and. I've added a new error. Uh, the error that was was just that we, we w didn't finish the refactoring. We changed how these navigation views and, and everything was coupled. Um, yeah. Uh, so this is the product view. And you can see, still see this diagram that I've just added uh, as an image. Uh, but there is still a couple of things to do. We don't have this like-unlike behavior yet. So we're going to focus on that. If, and if I click on the unlike, we can see that um, we still don't um, have any way of actually liking things. So uh, that is what we're going to focus on. We can see that we call an undefined method do like in the popularity controller. So let's check the code. And let's be a bit quick about it. We had a store controller. And this store controller only did one thing. It really only uh, lets us navigate between, lets us navigate between these two views, really. It contains one logic if statement. And that if statement was part of the use case, and that is why I keep it here. It, yeah. Uh, we, let's imagine that we have more behavior, like buying products and putting products into um, shopping baskets and stuff like that, and create orders. That kind of interaction would also happen in the store controller. But right now, we can only view a product or view a, a selection of products. Um, the way we view products is that 
if the navigation view says that we have a product that the customer wants to see, then we have some kind of behavior. And we initiate, initiate a product view down here. And if we don't have that product view initiated, it is null from the beginning, uh, then we view the product catalog view. So it's just a, uh, a matter of which view is returned from this class. We also introduced the like controller here. And the like controller behavior should only happen if, if the customer wants to see a, uh, a product, right? So we create that controller up here, create that controller popularity uh, controller, and that controller has some uh, relationship that we must fulfill. It needs the popularity view, and it needs a product like. It needs a model object, and it needs a view in order to, to work. And we specify that in the constructor of that, uh, of that class. So before I create the product controller, I actually create a model, the product likes model. And I send the product from the product catalog view to that model. So the model knows which product are we, check, are we uh, gonna check how popular that, that model, that product is. So we get the selected product uh, from the product catalog view. And um, if you remember from yesterday, that product catalog view is actually also using the navigation view. But does this translation from this little string uh, the unique product string to a high level object, a model object that it returns, right? So we get a model product, the selected product. And from that we can create the product likes model, and from that we can create a popularity view that needs the model, also needs a navigation view and a selected product, and from that two items we can cre create a controller. So we're, um, since these different classes have different needs, we need to supply them with the classes that fulfill these needs, right? So we, we uh, uh, connect these, uh, these classes and we like, um, like, it's almost like a puzzle where we have a class has some needs, it has some, some dependencies, and we fulfill them by uh, dependency injection. Okay. So now we have a like controller. The like controller, we call the do like on that. That is really um, just letting the, this like controller um, uh, do its thing, really. It's, uh, it's reacting on its, uh, on its input, and it produces some changes in its model. After that, I create a product view uh, just to fulfill this last part of code where we, I think maybe we can do like this, and you will see a little bit better here, uh, in order to, to um, be able to select the proper view down here, where we produce output from that view. Uh, Eric Hamrin asks, in the setup controller part, I guess um, this part, why not let the like controller handle that? Um, the reason for not letting the uh, popularity controller handle that is that the product view is using the popularity view. So I need the popularity view in both the popularity <laughs> controller and the product view. Since the product view is actually uh, rendering uh, what the um, popularity view is creating, right? You remember? So, um, so since I need that popularity view in both, I cannot hide that in popularity controller. Otherwise, I could do this in popularity controller. And the product likes is also necessary uh, for the popularity view. And since it's necessary for popularity view, I also must 
create this. If you have um, if you have a lot of this code, this construction code, uh, there is a pattern called factory that you can look up. Uh, right now, it's uh, overkill, really. Um, yeah. And I'm, I'm kind of showing you this sort of overcomplicated solution to this, because this dependency injection is really important, and a lot of students don't get it. So you need to practice this. You need to try it out on your own solutions uh, and see if you can manage. Uh, yeah. OK, that, that was the controller. The, the model has not really changed anything. Uh, we did, we did uh, start uh, with a product likes. And the responsibility of this class will be to, to um, control who has liked what product, really. So, um, and right now we just uh, read the number of likes from a file. And I've actually moved that file to a location outside of the uh, folder that I'm in. Anyone can imagine why I would want to do that. So you see the double dot it means that the data folder is no longer in the lecture code here. It's outside. So anyone has an idea why I want to move it outside of the folder? Yeah. Yeah. If I if I don't move it, if I keep it in in a subfolder, for instance. I can enter the URL for the data folder and the URL for the, uh, for the file, and I can get the contents of the file. So it's quite important to uh, somehow prevent uh, people from accessing these data files. And probably the best way of doing it is to um, move the data to a folder that is not shared on the web server. right? So the PHP script must have access to that folder in order to read and write. But the, the uh, Apache web server that I'm using, whatever web server you're using, should not have access to, to that file. right? Um, so the way I do it is that I'm using Vagrant. So I'm setting, uh, let's see. Somewhere. I don't see it. Weird. No idea how it disappeared. So I have different versions of this. I guess that I didn't commit the last one. Uh, but really, I, I have these synced folders and uh, it's not this prepared user picker, but it's another folder. And I set the owner to the user of the web server. And I make sure that folder is outside of uh, the, the, the folders that is shared by the web server. Um, yeah. OK. So the, the mission right now is to get the like behavior working. And we have a different, a, a couple of different rules, and one would be that one person only likes a product once, and right now every product has the same amount of of uh, votes, right? Since we only have one file, so uh, these two rules we must manage. We also don't have any way of unliking a product that we have liked, and, and we must make sure that. Only people who have liked something may unlike something, right? Um, so we need to not only have a single file with a number in it, we also must remember who has liked what, right? And I'm going to use files here um, for today. But let's go back and take it one step at a time. So the product controller. 
uh, calls a method called do like, and that method we haven't written it yet. So let's go to the product likes and add that method. A simple solution would be, right now, if we disregard the requirements I said, what would be to open the file called product likes, read the content of that file, and add a one to that content, and then write the content back into the file, right? That does not fulfill the other requirements. The uh, every user should be able to like just once and, and stuff like that. So in order to, to have like a, mm, um, yeah, in order for, to have a several users that can like different things, we probably should add something like a user ID or something like that, or some, some kind of key that represents a user. One way of doing that is using cookies. So we could say that uh, in order to call do like, we must, or the, the model needs a unique string. And this unique string is some kind of user ID, right? Um, so by adding this, we make sure that um, that we can create like a, a system, some way of storing things that uh, is using this unique string and make sure that um, different users um, may like or may unlike stuff, right? So if we have some kind of unique string down here, we could create one file for each user. Right? Um, yeah, so that is the idea. And in order to get that uh, working, we need some kind of file name for that. And we also had the other requirement that each product uh, should be, we should be able to like uh, different products and they should have different values for this. So one idea is that the file name contains these two inf pieces of information. The product unique ID and the user unique ID. And when I get the number of likes, I just check how many people have liked this product. How many files exist from different users on this product. Simple database. So if we concatenate and we also need the the product ID here, right? Something like this. Then we could, when we want to get the number of likes, we could like enumerate, read all files, check which files have this product ID, um, and we can report that number of files. like that, and there is a method called file put contents that takes a file name and some content. Actually don't need to write any content into the file since the file name itself contains the information. So it's sort of stupid, sort of a hack, but um, at least you get to see how, how to write files. I could write like content into the file here. Um, there are a number of 
of ways we could do this. We could have a file producer, and that file could contain different lines for different products, and we could see that. Um, yeah. But then we must parse each file and stuff like that. So I think this might be a bit easier. OK, so we, we put contents into that file, depending on the unique string and the product ID. OK. If we want to read all files in a directory, there is a method called scan directory that takes a folder and returns all the files in it. So it's pretty useful for us. Um, I must remember which folder it is. So it's probably a good idea to write into the same folder as I read from. And since I'm going to use this information in two methods, I create a private static. Call that the folder. And I give it the value dot dot slash data slash. So the file name must start with that, right? And the dots concatenate the string. And the directory is the self folder. And I get files in folder back. OK. Um, I'm just going to do a really stupid thing, but just to make sure that um, we can test anything and try out things before we get too excited about this. So um, let's go back to the code and reload. I just pressed. Uh, like, and we can now see that, okay, I need to supply this unique string into do like. So let's do that first. And that is in the popularity controller. So the popular popularity controller needs to know that unique string of the user. Some unique user ID. And let's put that idea, um, let's let the popularity view uh, create that ID for us. So like that. And then we need to create that method in popularity view. And just to not, not get too far away, I want to test this as soon as possible. I don't want to code too much before I've tried things. So I'm going to do a temporary solution. Like that. And to make sure I don't forget, I add a to-do. Mm. <laughs> Very good to-do. Add something. And then I test it. I resend that. It's probably the case that I didn't save the Oh, it might product likes get number of likes files in folder five. Oh, I got a lot of uh, different things here, so I'm going to remove everything here. And okay, I have three files in the folder, 
after pressing like. And that makes sense. These three files are the file that are created by pressing there on the do like. And it should be named like, mm, here, unique user ID dot dot Sony. Anyone else, anyone knows what the other files are? It's a Unix file system. So you actually do have like two files in this file system. And yeah, Johnny says that it's dot and a dot dot. So in a Unix system, in a folder, if you uh, enumerate the number of files, you get the dot, and that is the current location, the, the, the folder that you're in. And the dot dot is a link to the folder that uh, you come from, the folder that encapsulates this, this folder that you're in, right? So that is the parent folder. So I need to remove these two in order to get the number of likes, right? Um, OK, this looks quite nice. The unique user ID dot dot Sony. Uh, so the file name seems OK. From that, if I divide this string on the, on the colon colon, I could get all the files for, for a specific product. Um, so let's go and like the other product. And you can see that now, since we don't have any mechanism of uh, separating likes from different products, we get four likes here. So let's fix that. I create a variable called number of likes per for product, and I remove that one. And then I just step for for each files in folder. I don't need the key, but I need the value. That will be the file name. And then I explode the string. And explode takes a string and divides that string on some delimiter. So in this case, I have double uh, colon as a delimiter. And the string is the file name. Oops. Just so that you can see what I'm doing, I will var, var dump the array that I get back. And you can see that the array contains the dot, the dot dot. And it will contain the unique user ID. It will contain Philips 22 fat. It will contain the other uh, subarray will contain uh, unique user ID that came from the, from the uh, view and the Sony 50, right? So now I need to check if this array that I'm getting back from explode, if the second part has the same, um, if there are two parts and the second part has the same um, ID as the product that I'm getting here, right? So let's do that. If count the number of parts equals two parts, since that is the number of parts I need, and parts one, that is the second part, right, equals this product ID. If that is the case, the number of likes per product should be increased. With a double plus means increasing with one, right? So 
if I reload this page, I should get one like per product. Right? Um, if I remove one of the files from that folder, the Sony should get one and the other one should get zero. So uh, I'm in the other one, right? So I get zero and I go back and test that the Sony gets one like. Awesome, fantastic. I'm actually uh, unable to like this product anymore since uh, every user has the same ID. So the, the second part now is that a view must be able to tell who this user is by some kind of unique string. So let's go to the view. It was the popularity view where we have had our to-do thing. So one way of doing this would be to store this unique ID into a cookie, and that cookie is kept forever in the browser of the user. So at least for every browser, uh, the users only get one like. It's not a perfect system, not at all, but it's at least one way of doing it. And you need to know how to do cookies. So, so let's say that we try to read a cookie that we get in. We haven't written it yet, but we try to read that cookie. And there is a cookie array. And we need some location in that cookie array to store this. It's probably a good idea to use the name of the class and I actually use the namespace also. And then I have a third part, and that is the, um, the name or the, um, uh, of, the, of, of what I want, really. Um, user ID, let's call it like that. And I move that up to a private, static, um, cookie, cookie uh, ID equals like that. And I need a dollar sign also. So if is set If there is a cookie with some kind of unique string in it, we return that unique string. If it's not, then this is a user who has never liked anything before, never looked at a, a product before, then we need to create that unique ID. And we need to set that cookie into the user's um, uh, browser, and we also make, need to make sure that uh, we get something that is unique. So there's a, a function called set cookie, and the name is the first thing that we send, self uh, cookie ID, and these two strings in in the, the lines above must be the same, and that is why I use this private static. It's private since we're not supposed to use that from another way. So here now, I need to have some kind of unique string in cookie, like that. OK, in order to, I need to return something here, here also. Right? So uh, I need to create, um, so I would return this unique string in cookie, right? Oh, I would actually do, yeah. So remove that and create a variable.
Yeah. We remove that one since every part of the if statement is returning something. I've forgotten a parenthesis, something like that. Um, yeah. Reload the page. And I press like, and you can see now that uh, I was able to write a new cookie or a new uh, file since I had a new string. If we check the files, you can see that unique string from cookie and unique user ID. That was the old one. That, that temporary solution does not work anymore. Um, so let's remove that one. OK. Uh, let's check also the cookies in the browser and make sure that we have a cookie now. And let's remove all the um, things that I've created. Press like. And you can see that I now have a cookie with unique string in cookie. So I've, I've tested a little bit before. That is why there are cookies. Um, OK. <coughs> that seems to work. If I press like again, that does not work, since we've already got a file called that. Um, it would be kind of nice to actually have a unique string here per user also. So let's create that. And I'm just going to like cheat a little bit. Um, so I'm, I use this unique string uh, in cookie, and then I use a encryption method called SHA1, and then I just use a random number into that one, like that. And let's see what we get. So I reload this. I actually got the same cookie since I already liked something. So I need to remove that cookie, reload it again. And you can see that now I get a seemingly unique string. Uh, it's, it has value like six, unique string in cookie 6699, something like that. If I remove that and reload again, I get a new one, right? Unique string in cookie 35C7. Oh, there is actually a method that creates unique IDs. Uh, so if you want to use that, you can check it up. Might be that uh, not every version of PHP is using this. Um, yes. Uh, Yeah, uh, in the chat they say that when you set a cookie, you can also have an expired date. And that is probably a good idea. The next time the user returns, he will uh, to this same page. If it's a different session, he will get a new idea. So we probably need to set an expired date. So let's do that. And that was the third. And in most systems, time is handled by a Unix timestamp. So this time will return the number of seconds since, I think, the 1st of January 1970 or something like that. Um, so let's set that time plus the time that we want. I think that you can say, uh, minus one or something like that, and it will be like forever. Is that correct? Anyone know? I have no idea. But let's say that we just want a year, so 60 seconds times 60 minutes times 24 times 365 days, something like that. And Let's remove this cookie that has session lifetime. And 
it should be replaced with something that uh, has a year of lifetime, right? Yes, 2016, it says. Good. That would enable us now to, if I open, now I cannot like this again and get another one, but if I open it in Firefox, so I get a new version, I will get a new cookie, right? So now I can uh, like it again. Fantastic. Okay. Now we want to be able to unlike things, and we also want to change the name on the like button if we're voting for a product or not. Um, so let's start with the first thing that if we vote for a product, we uh, get the correct name, we get unlike. If we haven't voted yet, we should get a like name, right? So that is the popularity view, and this we like the thing, I've just set the temporary name to true, uh, boolean to true, but the one that knows this information is the product likes. So let's ask that one. This product likes has user liked. And now I need to supply the user ID. I should probably um, get a problem here. Uh, it's not that obvious, but um, somewhere in the code in the um, in the controller, I will call it get user ID once, right? And now, when I create the output, I will call it twice. So when the get user ID is called first time and we don't have a cookie, the second part of the code, line 29 to 31, will be called, right? And we get a proper set of cookie. Uh, but the second time, in the production of the output, I would call get user ID again. Oh, I shouldn't call it uh, statically. I should call it uh, on the method. Uh, and this cookie array on line 26 still won't co contain a cookie. Because set cookie sets a cookie in the HTTP header that has not yet been sent to the, to the browser. And the cookie array only contains the cookies the browser sent to us. But that hasn't happened yet. So it's something that I almost always do when I set cookies is that I also set the same place in the cookie array. Um, yeah, with the, to the same value. So this little hack actually saves me a lot of, of, of trouble. And since, since um, HTTP protocol, we must remember in which call we are and what information is on its way to the browser and from the browser. This way, I don't need to remember that anymore. So uh, remember that little hack, probably a good idea. OK, uh, so let's ask the model who has liked and if we have liked it. So create that function. Has user liked, and as before, we needed to send it the string. And we can actually copy a bit here. So I need the same file name. Could be a good idea to put it in a, in a separate uh, method, a private method that creates this file name. Um, since I got a little bit of code duplication and these two lines need to be the same in order to save files the same way that I read files, right? Um, but there is a method called file exists. 
and I ask it, does the file exist? Like that. And I've already liked this one, right? Oh, sorry. File name with big N. Yeah. Camel notation is a good thing. So I've already liked this thing, so I should have an unlike button. Right? But I should not get this, you just like this thing, right? Um, if I remove all these and reload the page, I should get a like button, right? And if I press it, I should get an unlike button. If I, if I reload, I still get an unlike button. Fantastic. That is progress. Um, yes. So let's take a short break, uh, 10 minutes. So let's be back in quarter past 11. Okay. So I just posted yesterday's uh, lecture, uh, at least the YouTube uh, version of it. Um, so normally, uh, I try to post these lectures as soon as possible, but yesterday was a bit crazy. So, um, and uh, I haven't posted any more information uh, right now, and the little uh, image down there is not uh, okay yet. But at least I try to post stuff as fast as possible. Uh, if I forget altogether, since I've got a lot to do, a lot of students, a lot of emails, a lot of things that is happening, um, just remind me. I don't mind, right? So uh, post on Slack and, and remind me. It's not, it's not a problem. OK. Um, so we need some mechanism for unliking things. Uh, now we have a mechanism for liking things, and the button changes. Uh, value, but we need a mechanism for unliking things. And this is actually a part of the use case, right? So it's a separate use case, um, but it's so similar to the like use case, I can probably get away of having the same controller. Um, so the customer selects a product she has previously voted for. The system provides an opportunity to decrease the popularity of that product. Um, and uh, customer removes their vote for the product, and system displays the popularity of product also that the customer no longer votes for that product. So let's do that, and let's change the controller. So we have a popularity controller. Did you customer press like? In that case, we have two different things that could have happened. Either the, the customer actually pressed, pressed unlike, or the customer pressed liked. So two different things that could have happened. And to distinguish between these, we can check the model state. Has the user already liked something? If this product likes, has, oh, I don't remember, has user liked. And we need this unique ID here also. If the user did not yet like this product, or he has liked the product already, so we unlike this. Do unlike. Yes. Uh, not, not, not really. The cookie is, is there for providing a, a unique user ID. So that is a way of distinguishing between different users. 
So right now, uh, the cookie should be the same for every product. Uh, so the thing that I'm deleting is actually not the cookie, it's the model state, right? So, um, yeah. So we need a, a method in our model to unlike, and we also need the unique string for that one. Oh, sorry. And what we do here is that we need the file name once, once more. And you can see that now the file name, the same string, is in three different files. We really need to remove this and put this into a separate method. But let's do that in the second step. OK, so there are a method called delete, or is there? So let's check out the PHP delete, the manual for that one. And you can see now, here's something that I wanted to show you, that there are something called unlink. And that is actually the method or the, the method that removes files. <coughs> so you can see down here, unlink deletes files. Um, you can see that this is a dummy manual entry to satisfy the need of those who are looking for unlink or unset in the wrong place. Right. So actually, the, the PHP manual is quite good. Uh, and I think that um, the PHP manual is one reason for PHP's success. And if we check the unlink, We can see uh, up here how they specify things, but we also get an example of how someone has used this. And also, we get examples of how the community is using this, and they are educating each other and, and us in order for this. So um, I actually think this, this thing that the community is able to contribute to the manual is really good. So if you want something, it's a good chance that you can find it on php.net's manual pages. Yeah. So let's use unlink. And file name. So I press unlike, the like is removed, the file is actually removed, and I can see that I like. Again, you just like the thing, and I remove my vote. Fantastic. Excellent. Um, yeah. Why does websites always inform one that they are using cookies? Isn't it something that you have to do by the law or? Uh, yeah, it is. So um, <laughs> uh, we need to, I, I guess that the, the session cook is not really included in this. I, I, I'm not really sure if there have been any like um, um, judge. Something, some rettegång trials where where uh, where this has been uh, seen if if someone has actually needed to change their code uh, for session cookies. Uh, so I guess session cookies will be okay. Uh, but I've seen pages that are just saying, okay, we're using cookies. If you continue, you agree to use cookies, right? And in a way. Um, <laughs> My point of view is that, OK, this is a sort of stupid law, since they don't, I don't know if they say anything about uh, client-side uh, storage or what it's called. Client, what's it called? <laughs> uh, there are other ways of storing things than cookies, you know. Local storage. Uh, anyone know if local storage is included in this law? Or is it just cookies? 
So I, I think, sort of think it's a stupid law. Uh, but um, yeah, I, I think that privacy issues is, is important. Um, and I think that maybe all sites need to be informing their users that they are uh, actually uh, collecting information on them. But um, yeah. Uh, I don't think the lawyers could tell the difference, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, as an examiner, I don't care. I'm, I'm not your judge, right? I'm, I, I don't put you on trial uh, more than for setting a grade. Right? But uh, following the laws of the country that you're publishing your application in is probably a good idea. So put a, a small um, note that, OK, if we if you continue to use this application by logging in, you agree to our conditions, whatever. Um, yes. Yeah, we had some refactoring to do. And this refactoring was that we had uh, several lines, uh, 42, 38, and 44, uh, that actually contain some duplication. So let's do a refactoring. I create a private function, get file name. And in order to call that one, I need the unique string. And it's actually going to do what I've said here. And instead of putting that in a um, in a variable, I just return it, and then I can call this method everywhere. This get file name unique string, yeah, like that. Remove that line. Something like that. If I'm really, really into keeping things dry, this double colon down here is, should be, always be the same as the double colon up here, right? Since I'm exploding on that one. So there is a relationship between these two things. One way of just showing the programmer that this is an important relationship is to write a little line in the documentation. So we. Please note that is from the get file name. And maybe also down here. Please note that effects like that. That way, when a programmer updates this, since these two strings must always be the same, when a programmer updates the code, he will find his way and update both locations. If we have these implicit relationships, dependent, implicit dependencies, explicit is where we have code that, that will give us an error if we write it wrong. Uh, this code won't result in an error. It will just be an error, and I probably won't get any error message either. I will just get files that are named something else. Um, yeah. I could uh, create a static dependency as uh, they are writing in the chat by writing a private static. I'm going to leave that out for you guys because I want to tell you other things right now. Um, Is there a point of making method static, for example, method get file name in product likes? Uh, I try to avoid static as much as possible. Uh, and the reason for that is uh, you, you kind of end up in the single uh, singleton um, swamp. And you start writing much of your code as static, and you stop thinking in object-oriented ways. And really, you're not writing object-oriented code anymore. 
Um, so um, I guess that um, some other people have, have uh, written a bit about static versus a non-static code. Uh, so you can read up on that yourself. Um, yeah. So I'm going to continue, or uh, using the correct computer. And we're going to do a bit of recapping. Um, so this is, these are the lecture notes. So um, for documentation, I use these at tags, like I showed yesterday. Uh, you can read up on PHP Documenter. Uh, it's a kind of nice application that allows us to generate uh, documentation from our source code. So it reads a source code file tree and produces HTML uh, documentation for your code. It's sort of a nice thing if you have, if you're providing an API, for instance, or something like that. Uh, I use these at tags mainly for um, two different things, return values and parameters that are not specified uh, by type. So here we have a case. We have a char set. Um, so I've, I've actually documented it up here that it must be a char set. It must be a string. It should be something like UTF um, minus 8. Um, yeah, like that. I also try to specify return values like I do down here um, so that the one who is using this method can, can, from outside or without reading the method, understand what this method does. What kind of output do I get? I try, whenever possible, to use good naming. So you can see that I get an HTML page from this method. And that one is return. Since I say get, I mean return, right? Is, is, if I say is something or has, then I probably expect a Boolean back, right? Um, if it changes something, some state, I almost always say do or something like that or change something. So instead of writing tons of comments that is, is describing everything, uh, I try to, to to work with my, with my method naming, my class naming, my um, variable naming, so that the code will speak for itself, right? Um, yeah. Um, I know that a colleague of mine wants to do it the other way around. He writes stories about his code. So every method has like a story above it. Uh, half a page or something like that. And for me, that is too much, and I don't read it. And if I don't read it, and I refactor the code like I did today, then my, the, the comment and the code will diverge from each, each other, right? So and there is some uh, interesting research that says that programmers tend not to trust documentation. And this is the reason, because the documentation tend not to be true anymore. OK, uh, so try to explain as much as possible by the code itself, the naming of the code itself. So that is why my code is a bit uh, sparse when it comes to documentation. But I try to document parameters that are not typed and uh, return values. Also, if you have a power tool, a, a powerful IDE, uh, it can probably tell you what the return value is the type of the return value if you like hold your mouse over the call to the method. So it will provide you a little bit of documentation. So, uh, and the most important thing that is not visible if you have good name of the method is what is returned. Um, yes. Okay, let's go back to controllers. Controllers handle high-level input from the views. What I mean with high-level input is logical input in the form of model objects. 
and booleans. Most often like booleans. And, and we can see that in our controllers. We have two of them. Here, we get high level input, did customer press like. We didn't get a, there is a string in uh, post or something like that, or there is a boolean in post. We get a high level information, a call to a method that says what, what has happened. Customer pressed like. Um, the did here means a boolean. Boolean answer to that, right? And then I get a user ID, and this is a bit um, vague, right? What is a user ID? And actually, it's a string, right? So this is sort of not high level. So this is a point of refactoring. It actually probably, the hacker in me, or the, is it called hacker still? Hacker has changed meaning over, but you know, the one who is hacking into systems, right? Hacking in me says that this will be dangerous, since uh, this will be produced in a file name, and someone can probably change another file or delete some important file from you if they produce correct uh, input into your program, right? So you probably need to put some security on this thing. And that secured on that thing, the rules around get user ID should probably be its own class. So let's put a to-do here. Yeah. OK. Let's go back. Uh, the second thing is that controller makes state-changing calls to the model. Let's check that also. Here, the customer wants to see a product, but uh, we don't have any real st state change in this one. But in the other one, in the popularity controller, if user pressed like and he has liked it before, we ask the model to change its state. OK. The third one is the controller selects which view is going to be uh, used to view to render the data. This, this part of the controller could actually be done in a view. Since view can check model state, so if, the, if what view is viewed only depends on model state, the views can do this themselves, right? But if this depends on controller state, uh, the views need the help of the controller to select which view is going to be viewed. Okay. Um, yes. So views produce HTML. We have seen that several cases from model objects. Views translate from low level input. Low level input is the get, post, cookies, files. Um, yeah, it reads, perhaps reads in get and returns model objects or booleans. Uh, may have access to model if the view does not do any state change of that model. It may create model object, objects that do not change the state. So it can call the constructor of like a product or whatever, um, but it may not change, save that product somewhere in a database or save that product on a file or something like that. Views may have uh, states like messages that persist between calls. Oh, that is one thing that is quite important. So um, a problem with our fantastic application, if I'm allowed to say that we have problems in it, is that I press like here, and then I reload the page, and that like is reloaded, no, it's resent into the application, right? Since post is stored in, in the browser's uh, cache memory of the request we've done. Uh, so one way of avoiding that is doing a reload, a header location. So I'm actually going to do it this way. Oh. 
So I'm just going to commit the code. And I'm going to check out another branch. Oh, awesome. And this is my working branch when I'm preparing for this lecture. So it contains code that we have done not done yet. But um, let's see if we get it working. So um, it still contains the liking or not, but when I reload, that uh, posting is not sent anymore. So the way I do it is that I reload the page. So let's check the code. And now you might not recognize yourself since this is another branch, right? Um, and yeah. So let's see um, if I can find it. OK. So this is in the view. And this change that I've done is actually only in the view. So if the customer did press like, this is in the, in the output generation. We know that the customer has liked or unliked the product. Uh, we need to reload this page. And I actually. Uh, put the responsibility of reloading into the navigation view, since the navigation view uh, knows how, w w where I'm going, to what product I'm going to look at. So ask the navigation view to reload. That is creating a HTTP header location call. The header location will be sent down to the browser, who will directly reload the page to the new URL. Um, so it will be reloaded. And when I get back, when the browser is calling my server again, my message is lost. So I need to save that message somewhere on the server or down in the, in the client before I uh, reload my page. So you can see that I actually save it in the session right now. So save that message that you removed your vote from it. And then. When I get back, I, don't get, I didn't get a uh, press like call. So we check if, if there is anything in this location in the session. I read that from the session, and then I unset the session. So I remove it from the session, so I don't see that message again. So we're just going to check the code in, in the navigation view. And really, this is all you need to reload the page. It says an HTTP header with the location. And the location is the URL for the product that we're viewing. So it's quite simple stuff. Um, this code will, of course, be out there also. So you can use the same thing. So let's get back to the lecture notes. Uh, so the views um, may have view state. And that, what I mean with view state is these messages, really. It could be something, a state that does not affect the model at all. Like the view, the, the customer just want to see the uh, views in a specific way every time. Uh, like, I always want um, ascending order. Or I always want the pink background, or something like that a view state, something that it's not affect any rules in the model. Uh, it has nothing to do with a controller um, use case or something like that. It's just a setting for view. Like when you're playing a game, you can set the resolution somewhere, right? That is a view setting. So that is view state. OK, model classes encapsulate domain rules. Validation happens in model constructors, throws exceptions if error is going to be handled. Uh, asserts if it's a programmer, programmer's error. And um, models handle state and state changes that has to do with the domain rules. Model classes may not create output. HTML should not create messages that is going to be viewed by the, or rendered, viewed by the, by the customer itself. 
So these exceptions may contain some kind of message, right? You've seen that I've written some kind of message there. Uh, like the input of the uh, some method is wrong or something like that. That string should not be viewed by a customer. That is only for the programmer's benefit. And the reason for that is you should view the model and everything in it as something that is constant. If we replace a view, that model should always be the same. So if you have a, an English sentence in that exception and you write it out, but you want to create a Swedish view for the same model, for the same application, you should be able to, to replace every string in that application, even the error message, right? Um, So a message in the, in the model may not be shown in, in the view. The view may read stuff from the model, yes. Yeah, so, but, but the output, the, the logical message is something that is supposed to be read by a programmer. But the output message, the actual message to the, to the customer of the application, should be generated by the view. So instead of outputting what the, what the model says to me, I need to translate that to the language or the, to the protocol that I'm speaking with my customer. So think of this. If we have one, the login application, since you're writing it, right? So right now I said that you're not allowed to use JavaScript, right? That, that, that is a requirement, and you won't get uh, accepted if you're using JavaScript to solve the problem. So, uh, but afterwards, when you're done with this, you could remove your views, or you should be able to remove your views, and replace them with JavaScript-enabled views, and the rest of the application should be the same. But the JavaScript-enabled views may want to communicate like uh, through um, Ajax, Ajax, yeah, you know, asynchronous calls to the, to the server. Uh, and the Ajax wants a, or the JavaScript application does not want a string that says that the, it's the wrong username or password. It wants a logical message that you can write an if statement around so that you can, like, create JavaScript code that is handling that. So, so, so you, you don't send an error message that is going to be viewed. You send a logical error, like a Boolean, or you send a different types of exceptions. Since you can subclass the exception, you can have different exceptions, like uh, wrong username exception, and, or wrong password exception, or uh, user does not exist exception. So you can have different exceptions, and then in your try-catch, you can catch these different exceptions, generate the correct output, um, and stuff like that. OK. Yeah. So I know that for assignment two, uh, there will be like problems with your solutions, right? Um, and there are a lot of of different rules, and these rules are going to be translated into a grade. Right? So I expect for the, like, the A students, since this course is graded with from A to F, the A st students, they already know this. right? They know how to do this. For the rest of you, I expect that you, have some, you will have some trouble, and you will try to learn this until next week, right? Um, yeah. And it's a good thing to like, OK, I tried this out, and I, uh, I ask uh, in Slack or uh, during the, uh, the help session this week, right? Um, so it, like a single like, problem in your solution won't mean that you don't get any grade. It just means that you won't get the highest grade, right? So 
Um, yeah. May interact with session, files, databases to, st to enable state, right? Um, there is this array called server. It's a super global array and it's sort of a border case. But for this course, I'm going to allow you to use this server array from the model. It's sort of a border case since this information is not per se sent from uh, the user, but some or some information in it is actually sent from the user, like uh, the, the kind of browser the user uses or something like that, or the IP address of the user. Uh, but just ignore that. For simplicity, we allow you to use server in model. Okay. Uh, so, uh, question for deadline for uh, assignment two is Wednesday morning next week, if I understand the deadline document correct, right? So, yes, the deadline for assignment two is on your uh, uh, examination, uh, in, in the beginning of your examination. So, in the schedule for your group, for, for your class, there will be an examination date uh, next week, right? So, uh, so your uh, deadline is on that. Uh, during the, the examination, I and um, my colleague will show you one solution. After that, we will have a discussion. Like, I didn't do that, or maybe some of you had a better solution than me, and we, we show that and we discuss that, or uh, like that. But you won't get, it's not an examination, you won't get a grade there. Me and my colleague will like afterwards, or <laughs> uh, we will, uh, we have a grading form that we will check every, every solution, and then you will get some kind of email or feedback from that. Yes, sounds good. I, f I think it will be a, a good thing to get some feedback on your solutions, uh, but we won't have time to sit down with every one of you. Uh, so you will get some feedback that, okay, you had this uh, state, uh, you handled this view state in the other class or whatever. Or you got um, excellent on MVC implementation, but a really low on code quality or something like that. Yes. Um, awesome. So. Uh, Matilda asks if um, she's having a real hard time figuring out what projects to do. Will this year's project differ much from last year, or can I read those instructions to start thinking about my product now? Yes, you, you probably should start thinking about your product. Project. I want these projects to be a bit smaller in scope than last year, um, depending on grade. So if you aim for the highest grade, scope will be a factor, right? Um, my idea for, th for this year's project is that you need to have some idea, some customer for your project, and something that you're solving, some problem that you're solving for someone. It could be a programmer. So if you want to create like a small API for something, you do that. And you present this API on GitHub publicly so that um, in a way that, that you would present something to other programmers, right? Uh, it could also be a small application that handles something uh, a bit limited. But I've seen very, uh, very many uninspired projects that is just another school project. And those are boring for me since the student didn't want to do them. And those are worse boring for the student since they just did something just to get approved, right? So try to find out something. Oh, I want to do this thing. And then you take a discussion with your um, tutor and me or Andreas and, and ask him, if uh, do you think this is a good idea for a project? Uh, and um, we try to limit the scope a little bit and we try to get something working that has value, right? If you produce something that has value, it will become much more fun, both for me and for you and perhaps we change the world a little bit. 
Awesome. Thank you very much for today.